So the objective of this uh, panel is for you to tell us about your experiences, your success cases, the challenges, the uh, uh, barriers that you have faced, and what we have learned when generating or incorporating women to uh, added value chains. It has to do with companies, yes, uh, and the supply of them, but also it has to do with going from informal to formal work. And also, of course, it has a lot to do with valuing what women are doing, and mostly even to identify the possibilities of potential so that then they can do more and that they can do even more things. So I would like to start the way that uh, the order that we presented uh, you with Luisa Maria Alcalde with the perspective from the public sector about how to incorporate women in high value uh, activities from uh, formality to informality to formality, of course, how to deal um, with teenagers uh, or youngsters or groups that have been usually invisible and that require not just more attention, but mostly to have a plan where we can all uh, cooperate. Well, thank you very much for the invitation. I am very happy for being here today. The truth is that this is a privilege to share with you brilliant uh, women and all of you that are here present. I would like to, maybe it would seem obvious, but we need to highlight the huge challenges that we have in this country. Uh, talking about inclusion of women in the m m labor market, but also talking about a very precarious or weakened uh, market, labor market, but general, uh, generally speaking, it's not just women, but also even men, the salaries, low salaries, few coverage of social security, more than half people that work don't have social security and they work in informality. And all of these challenges that are being presented um, in the working world. So part of the actions that we have tried to carry out in these months, already being in the new administration, is to try to attend or deal, uh, or on the one hand, a very specific topic of young people that don't study and they don't work, and not because they don't want to, and that they have actually been very stigmat uh, part of a stigma, which most of them are actually women. Uh, so all of these youngsters that are looking for alternatives and they have dreams and they have talents and they want an opportunity but that they have hit the wall. So in order to deal with this issue, we have been developing a very important alliance, very strong uh, alliance with the private sector mostly, but yes, also uh, with civil uh, society organizations so that we can uh, tackle this part and so that these companies can receive these youngsters and they can train them. This uh, program is called Youngsters Building the Future. And the idea is to uh, deal with all the youngsters between 18 and 29 years old that don't work so that they can actually be trained in productive activities and of different companies from the biggest to the smaller and in different uh, economic activities all around the country, in the cities, but also in the mountain areas and the rural areas. This has allowed uh, up to today a little more than four and a half months of having launched these programs that we have more than half a million, we're talking about 600,000 apprentices, where most of them are women. 57% of these apprentices are women, and I think that that shows the reality, and it shows that for women, it is way more complicated to be part of the work or labor market, and that is why they go to this opportunity. They take this opportunity of uh, young people building the future, and they try to find this alternative. So we believe that it is a great achievement. There are very diverse women. Most of them actually have already finished the university. Some of them couldn't manage to finish their studies even if they wanted. But I believe that this is a, an important effort and it would be important to also highlight that this is an alliance. There couldn't exist a program like that if 
companies and civil society organizations and even the government couldn't agree on uh, doing something for them, for these women. Most of them in the informality and with a lot of difficulties that now have a possibility to have a different, a different future. What have you learned from the government of what companies ask you in, in this program? I think that we have actually learned a lot. Can I, can I say something? Sure. We were actually talking with Lisa Maria and Luis as what what learned as a company about this program. So first I would like to mention that when we asked uh, for volunteers to have tutors, because a very important part of the program is having a tutor. So when we chose internally who would like to be a tutor for this program, we had so many that we had to actually be very selective. All of our employees actually have that calling of helping the other. So what we did was just chose uh, 100 tutors. That's what we do, uh, what we did. So we have a total of 1,400 uh, youngsters eventually. Right now we have around 160. So uh, the first things that we discovered is that uh, two-third parties of the, those that came to work uh, to PepsiCo in Mexico are women. That is something uh, emblematic in what Luisa Maria is saying because we need to give way more opportunities to women and when you do that, they come to you. So two-thirds of them are women. Second, In the second place, uh, some of them, one-third actually, are already graduated and they came from all the different types of careers and they, couldn't, they just couldn't get a job. Luisa Maria. So I, I, I remember, for example, there was a, a person that had a BA in geography, and so Luisa Maria came to PepsiCo, and the human resources would have said, just, okay, the CV doesn't, we don't need that, it doesn't work. But because they arrived through this program, we learned that a person with a BA for geography can be actually great for our company, and we shouldn't even have these profiles uh, or job descriptions so uh, limited as we maybe did at some point. On the other hand, we're also loving seeing this union or this relation between uh, the tutor and uh, the young people. A tutor that has to say, okay, so here you need to come at a certain time. I'm going to explain to you what it is to work from Monday to Friday, complying with a certain set of rules here. We like uh, for you to come dressed in such a way, and this is what you have to start doing so that you can develop on your uh, career. Okay, I would like to ask you uh, to Rosa Maria, Paula, what myths regarding incorporating youngsters were broken for you, Paula, and to you, Paula, what myths were broken when working with a private sector or a company? What myths were broken? Well, we could see way more diverse profiles as a as a company. Of course, we have all types: engineers, people in accountant, accountants, all types of profiles. And also, we have a lot of levels as well. We have salespeople, uh, people uh, in the plants, etc. So, what we understand is that maybe yes, we did have our profiles to a little too pre-designed or a little too rigid and not as flexible as they should have been. That was uh, something that we learned. Okay, and so what myth was broken for you or debunked? Well, what I would say is probably I, I, I think I was impressed by the commitment that was immediately taken. Of course, at first there were some doubts. How is it going to be? Uh, who am I going to get here? How would that be like? But afterwards, as is that it, it has been increasingly advanced and growing, the truth is that I actually have had a really good experience of saying there are not just companies that say, okay, I will receive them, but there is actually a commitment of saying I'm going to train them and I'm going to give them a possibility of having a future and I'm going to train them so that I can also have better employees. So there, there has been that real possibility of working together and building a program that is nobody's. We have managed to have 
this idea that this is not from a government, this is not from a company, this is not from a ministry. It's from everybody, for the people. Okay, so Elizabeth Vasquez, you were mentioning the role in government organizations. So how should they be working in this program, but generally speaking, in these projects of empowering women? Let's let's say uh, whenever we talk about exercising their economic rights, how, how do you deal with that, with the NGOs? Well, we have many uh, organizations and foundations that foundations that are actually participating. Also, as tutors, they work the same way. They receive the youngsters, they incorporate them in the activities that they are impulsating. So, we have from organizations that actually empower women. We have organizations that, for example, take care of the environment or they take care of children. So there is a really huge diversity. And part of uh, the project from the beginning was that most of it could be private sector, understanding that they had more possibilities that once that they had finished the training to be hired, but always knowing that it is important that also organizations can receive these youngsters and can form them in all of these commitments that and, and that they can guide them. Okay, permiso. My español is horrible. Entonces, inglés. Permiso. Um, thank you, Chiara, and to the Women's Forum for bringing all of us together. I think the conversation about the role of women, not just as employees, but as employers, is extremely important. And I think that's why the Daring Circle focused on uh, inclusive sourcing and helping women-owned businesses grow. Because the truth is, a lot of women can't find jobs that they care about or that they want to, that they have an opportunity for. And so they need to start a business. And so these are the women-owned businesses who, either out of necessity or out of passion, because they have a solution that we all would benefit from, start a business. And we need a lot more of them, because these women, how many of you are women-owned businesses? These women are amazing, and we should all be buying from them. <laughs> because when we buy from these women, they have the ability to create the jobs that can contribute to the goals that the minister has. So what is the, what is the most important thing in Latin America? I mean, we, we have heard a lot about uh, that issue in developed countries, United States, Canada. Is there any significant challenge in Latin America that is different from other parts? I think the potential here is significant because you have so many people who are so entrepreneurial. Again, out of passion or out of necessity, you have people who take risks every day to go out and create a job for themselves and a job for others. And I just have so much respect for the women of Latin America who increasingly are joining together and helping each other. They're not seeing each other as competing against each other. I see a lot of the women in the We Connect network doing business with each other. The women are starting to buy from each other, creating joint ventures, and that allows them to scale so that they can sell you to PepsiCo. You want me to tell the story? Please do, because PepsiCo is on the cutting edge. You are leading a lot of this. No, there's a story I like. Can I, can I tell a story in Colombia, for example? So the women in Colombia, um, the people that have, the women that have the less opportunities in, in the world, possibly, are victims of the FARC, right? And they have nowhere to go. They're uh, oftentimes widows with many children behind. So what we did is we need uh, plantains. No, so you've tried some bites, platanitos, no, and we need plantains as a company. We make that product. So why not help the people that need help? Um, we created a cooperativa, a co-op, co where uh, all these women uh, that are victims of the FARC uh, help us uh, in the supply chain of plantain. No? And as uh, we, you know, we built a facility for plantain management, we built um, una, um, a, a guarderia, we built a, um, a dining hall and the whole facility. And everybody that works inside the co-op is a woman victim of the FARC, and boom, 180 change. 
percent change. No, they, they um, be with when women in Latin America, Luis, when they have opportunities, they shine, and they are the best in the world, and they create a prosperity where there is war, where there is um, hate and where there is poverty. Okay, so let's talk about opportunities. You say whenever they have opportunities, they shine. What would be the opportunity window, most important one that an entrepreneur woman would need, according to your experience? Okay, well, first would be training, Luis. Training is very important, so I'm going to just tell you a story actually uh, very close here in Vallejo, a plant here in Mexico City. Rocio. Rocio used to say, she used to actually tell me, Paula, I never believed that I was going to be able to handle or learn how to deal with a little robot. And the little robot was actually a huge automated machine that is terrifying. And how, was it look, how was it physically? Well, it was pretty much the size of a, of a truck, just for you to give, uh, to get an idea. That's where we fabricate Maria's Gamesa. And I went to see when we were actually installing this machine, and it, it was just surrounded uh, by all the German engineers, you know, and not even the engineers the German engineers could know how to manage it. And even Rocio standing next to me, she said, well, I believe that, well, it wasn't working, you know, so this little robot, she said, maybe we should turn around this specific piece and probably this would work better. Okay, so tell me, tell me again, Rocio. So Rocio was explaining that, yes, we had to pack uh, the cookies the other way around so that the little robot could actually work. And so I talked to the engineers and so I told them, okay, so Rocio, she is in the operations part. Did you tell her, did you tell them that she was a, a NASA scientist or something? Well, it wasn't needed because her common sense was totally brilliant. And well, now she has a privilege of handling very sophisticated technology and she has been trained. She knows how to handle these little robots that I'm telling you about. And she didn't, it was just a little training that she needed. It was a little training that you give women in Latin America, the impact is amazing. We're talking about empowerment. What would be the key factor? Elizabeth, Elizabeth was saying there's a theme of uh, being employer or employee. But what would, what would you say is the opportunity window, the most important opportunity window for a woman to, to shine in this Sector. I think it has to do with training and with the possibility of having open doors for these spaces. It's important to work with the productive sector, with the companies, and with having clear pro, uh, recruiting processes, training, staff training, and to understand how employees can uh, level up in these uh, processes within the companies. I think we have clear mechanisms that uh, include the perspective of gender that don't discriminate, that are transparent. And in this way, we can build very solid mechanisms regarding the kind of opportunities that we have for who. So I think training is key, is crucial. Because I really agree with you that uh, training is a possibility of pushing these women into the right direction. Right. So, training, but even uh, or equal opportunities, right? If it's not even, then it's not going to work in the long term or even in the short term. And that's that's what we found. I mean, we can train the women business owners all day long, but if at the end of the day they don't have access to market intelligence and they don't have access to markets, what is it that the government buys? What kinds of products? What kinds of services? And why don't we have more women selling to get these larger government contracts? Same thing, we have corporations all over Mexico desperate to find women suppliers. In the WeConnect network, we work with women-owned businesses in 115 countries. And here in Mexico, we have a thousand women-owned businesses offering every kind of product or service you can imagine. They do, we have women here who do jewelry and chocolate, but we also have women that manufacture different types of plastics. They manufacture steel. We have women that make male urinals. 
at the conference we had, I don't know if that translates well, maybe not so much, but at, the, at our last, one of our conferences, we had a woman and there was a urinal and she was already selling to the cinemas here in Mexico and she wanted to sell to the hotels we work with. We work with Marriott and many others. And so I think we shouldn't limit the idea of what is it that women do. We have wonderful women artisans, but we also have women in heavy manufacturing in here in Mexico, and we have women in business services. They do printing, they do PR, marketing. We have law firms owned by women. You're, you're stating something that it, I think is very important, is going beyond the stereotypes. Yes. Uh, yeah, Paula, overcome uh, stereotypes. Paula, in order to prepare for this panel, you wanted to talk about uh, We Connect and how this has to do with the supply chain that has businesses led by women Apart from the experience we already heard from PepsiCo, what does this mean to have initiatives where we want to have women being suppliers? Well, at WeConnect, we see a lot of presence. WeConnect's work is a very strong pillar. Uh, sometimes as a company, we're able to connect these women who have the capacity and the intention of selling something to a company like ours. So we establish that, that connection. Of course, people from Procura can do the same. We Connect has a, another level of sensitivity in, in regards to this issue. Sometimes females do not approach certain companies because of the fear of rejection. And uh, in my case, well, we're a company that is trying to change that. And there are other companies that are working on that as well. We have open doors to any females who want to come and add something to our value chain. I could give you the 23%. The, uh, I could give you that figure. That's the percentage of women that we have in the agricultural sector, or 33% in other areas. So at a managing level, 41% of the agencies are being led by women. How much have you grown? We have grown so fast. We have goals. We have a global goal. Every country, every business, we have 20, 20, by 2025, we want to reach this 50-50 rate, ratio. And 20, 25 is just tomorrow, you know, it's so close. So we want to really achieve those goals by 2025. Could you tell me about any specific action in order to accelerate this process by 2025? Yeah, we already talked about the dual role of women. That is family, work, raising kids. For that, we have a lot of programs that are sensitive to this kind of situation. Programs that started for the benefit of women, but now they also benefit 100% of the population. Fatherhood, motherhood, so parenthood, basically both males and females, flexible schedules, home office, training, etc. All the kinds of things that have to do with the incentive that we need to, to do with the youngest generation. You talked about flexibility. Flexibility is one of the main challenges, not only for women, but also we as men, we also need more flexibility. Yeah, that's for sure. That's for sure. You need to go to your kids' recital. Yeah, well, I don't have kids, but I would like to, to, to have the time to do something like that. Maria, uh, in terms of parity, uh, from the governmental point of view or political point of view, how do you live this equity parity? What are you doing also at home in order to improve this situation? Well, 
Eh, I think that de, de we are es living de in muchas, a privileged muchas, moment muchas which is the product espacios. of many warrior women who fought for this kind of opportunities and spaces. Also, it's important to have a project, a governmental project, where the president actually decided from the first moment of his administration to have, uh, have women and have men conforming the cabinet. And this is uh, something that hasn't, uh, hadn't been seen before, to have the presence of so many women in the public service as legal representatives as well. In the labor ministry, we're trying to integrate as many women as possible. Both sectors, public and private, we see these networks of uh, cooperation that are bringing women together and pushing other women to also eh, enter this network. En, en, en We have been working eh, aspectos, pero in sobre several todo aspects, but from the governmental privado, point of view and the private sector and the ministry, I could tell you about a Mexican regulation that talks about zero discrimination and gender equality so that the companies start taking actions and having protocols, because sometimes what happens, and actually it happens a lot, they say, oh, I don't discriminate. Yeah, it's not that you discriminate, but let's see how many women you have at a managing level, or how many women you have hired at your company. So that is how you look at the companies and the experiences and the background of these companies, as well as other countries. So you are more open to point out the goals and objectives of incorporating women Elizabeth, in the product. We would like to hear from you. You have, a, in, in a way, a very broad perspective, continental perspective. How do you see the biggest challenges in getting into equality, parity, and all, all that things? So it's a good question, because how are we going to achieve the UN SDGs where we are saying with SDG 5, we want parity. How do we reach that by 2030? We can do some of that through um, employment, making sure women have an equal opportunity to get a job, to um, have a leadership role, to sit on a board of directors. But when you look at wealth and you look at assets, you have to look at entrepreneurship. It is the single most important way to get large amounts of money into the hands of women that they control, that they own. When they start a business and they grow a business, not only are they creating jobs for others, they are creating wealth. And women tend to hire more women in our network. They tend to be really good on social, really good on the environment. They tend to be really good on good governance. So all the things that the world is in so desperate need of today and in the future, women are particularly talented um, and able to deliver those types of aspects um, that all of our communities are so desperate for. In a, in a way, when we talk about business in forums like this, we tend to think in big corporations, but you're pointing to small businesses. What, what are the differences in the challenges for women in a small and medium business in big corporations? So we need to do all of it. Right? We can't pick no. just one or the other. It's, we have it's not to, that one are the good and we have to have, the other so are the, the bad. The fact is in Mexico and in almost every country, small businesses are the engine of growth. You all that own small businesses, you are the ones that are creating the jobs. And so we have to incentivize entrepreneurship. We have to do public-private partnerships with civil society to make sure that we're creating an ecosystem that is supportive of when a person decides, a man or a woman, that they want to take the risk to start a business, that they have all the support they need to be successful. We desperately need entrepreneurs to be very, very successful, and especially, in my opinion, women, because of the way they spend their money on their families and on their communities. It's different, and it's what the world needs. How would you describe dif different? Different, they, they spend more of it on, on education, on the healthcare, um, their kids tend to be, when women have wealth and education, their kids are taller, 
healthier, better educated over time. And it's not that men don't also invest in that. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that women on a day-to-day -day basis are usually responsible for taking care of and raising the boys and the girls. And if they're the primary caretakers and they have no control over their own wealth or they're not educated or they don't have an equal opportunity to contribute to economies, we will never reach equality. So. I totally agree with Elisa. I'll give you an example. In Mexico, we have a, a network of entrepreneurs. It's called Tenderas. 60% of convenience stores in Mexico are, um, uh, well, are owned by women. And these are the most effective people when uh, managing these little convenience stores because they take care of the neighborhood, the cleanliness of the space, and uh, whatever money they get, they invest it in their family's education and wellness. So we as companies are doing our very best so these women that are in charge of this small business, they can grow this business, maybe start uh, transitioning from the informal business to a more formal business. Yes, yes, Paula. This is a different program to support women, or is this a program only for convenience stores? Well, we are supporting convenience stores, because who do you think uh, Take, and take advantage of the training that we provide. <laughs> of course, women. Women are, are the ones taking advantage of the training we provide. They really appreciate it. A big percentage of uh, our students are women, and these are very empowered women. And they, these women are thriving to prosper. I'm sorry, uh, I'm having technical problems with the audio. Okay, so these women ask for advice, and I go like, yes, Maria, you can run your own convenience store, and you can do it better and more in a more formal way. Rosa Maria, we were discussing women in the labor world, and we have entrepreneurship in this uh, world and in the government. What do we need in order to empower more women, or in different words, how could we reflect women's ideas in the policies? Well, you know, there's something interesting that has to do with the vision. I'm sorry, I'm getting interference of audio. Ya tienen la semillita, ya empezaron, pero que tienen enormes dificultades y en nuestro país más. La gran mayoría de los primeros negocios iniciales pues no superan el año por todo lo complicado que significa. Dos entre dos tercios, 75 por ciento. 75% no supera el primer año, lo que te habla de todas las barreras a las que se enfrentan, pero también de esa... Eh, parte tan compleja de poder tener financiamiento, de poder acudir a créditos, una parte importante que eh, me parece que Graciela Márquez va a estar por aquí, pero, ni, pero tiene un programa muy, muy ambicioso de justamente créditos a pequeños negocios y muchos de ellos son mujeres que tienen y que ya iniciaron y que la idea es que puedan acceder a este préstamo y que una vez que lo pagan, porque aparte son las que más pagan, eh, puedan acceder a un crédito mayor y una vez que se pague puedan acceder a un crédito mayor, pero sin mayores dificultades, ¿no? porque muchas veces sí te doy el crédito, pero enséñame cuál es la escritura de tu casa. Bueno, no tengo propiedades, ¿cómo le hago para salir adelante? Entonces creo que este programa que se llama tandas para el bienestar y que tiene a su cargo la Secretaría de Economía, es un programa importante y que tiene como visión justamente eso, 
que se permita a los muy pequeñitos negocios tener la posibilidad de, de I'm sorry, poder I'm not consolidar su unidad económica y entonces emplear a otros alrededor de su comunidad. Y lo que necesitamos en México, sobre todo en el centro y en el sureste del país, donde hay muy poco crecimiento y no hay actividad económica, es ese impulso. Finalmente está demostrado que si incorporamos a las mujeres en el trabajo, vamos a crecer. Y eso está totalmente demostrado. Entonces, el impulso en eso me parece que es eh, muy, muy importante. Le, les quiero hacer una pregunta a las tres. Sé que estoy en condición de minoría. Es rarísimo estar en un panel donde haya más mujeres. Es rarísimo estar en audiencia donde son más mujeres. Si tuvieran que pedirle una cosa a los hombres para que sean menos tóxicos o más favorables, ¿qué sería? Empezamos contigo, Elizabeth. A ver, em So this is a team effort, and I think it's, it's really interesting because I went to Bangladesh recently and met with the CEO of the largest holding company in all of Bangladesh, and I was presenting the business case. Why should he be buying more from women-owned businesses in Bangladesh? After five minutes, he said, yeah, 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 I get it. Where are the women? Do you have a database? And we're like, yeah, we have a database, so let's, let's talk. But I was recently um, in, a, in a meeting with a an American, and he heard what we do, and he said, so, you, so you, you're promoting women. I said, yes. He said, so you hate men. <laughs> like, no, I love men. I love my husband. I love my, my family. No, this is not about taking from men and giving to women. This is about creating, innovating, more wealth for everyone, making sure that everyone has an equal opportunity to reach their full potential. To not be able to do that just because you were born a girl doesn't make any sense. And if you look at the statistics in Japan and what their ministers are doing, they are recognizing they cannot grow their GDP if they leave half their population behind. So there's an urgency that both men and women have to work together. One thing you asked from men? Buy from women. <laughs> Paula. Hire women, promote women, work together. I think it's helpful when men are aware of the needs and the culture and the bias that they have, the subconscious strength they have to discriminate. How do you identify this kind of bias? Well, in our offices, uh, we limit sometimes, well, they limit the amount of time a woman can participate or something. Sometimes males go like, in my team, girls, and I go like, hey, wait, they're not girls, they're women, executive women, professional women, so I don't really, I, I actually hate that word, girls. So these are the kind of comments that uh, led us to think, uh, but yeah, watch your mouth, that there are some bias, these are not girls, you should not be condescending with words like that. So culturally, we need to realize whenever we're, uh, uh, I don't know, having some kind of gesture or, or using some kind of word that is going to segregate. I agree. I would say let's work together so that uh, there's uh, equal opportunities for everyone. That's the most important thing to do. In our country, we have been uh, making progress identifying this possibility of uh, working together. It's not uh, females versus males. No, we need to cooperate. And before we finish with this uh, panel, I would like to say something. One of the important things that we have been doing and that has favored entrepreneur women is to have this cooperation networks. And one of the objectives that we have in the short term have to do with the integration of um, es un house, tema eh, house pues, digamos, doloroso que hemos dejado en Because, este I mean, país. They are Son más de 2 millones 300 mil trabajadores 
These women, these women are working, cleaning our homes, and they need to have access to health care. They, they should have opportunity for retirement and all of these things that they have been denied. Pues es so un far. momento relevante so en nuestro país de poder también en ese in sentido con las, las, eh, los trabajadores más vulnerables Because que en buena medida son los que son los trabajadores de hogar, hay una deuda. Some y of tiene que haber un women that I'm telling de, you about de nuestra the, uh, women that are cleaning para our homes. We need to give response to this needs. You are si at a entrepreneur uh, women forum. If you could ask que these women este programa, ¿qué sería? to contribute with something, pues, what would primero it be? First of all, para que puedan, to, este, ya to be kind of with uh, the workers that we have at home and to, to push forward so that they can have access to benefits and health care. Sometimes you have to do uh, very tedious paperwork that takes a long time. Nowadays we have a simple process where you access the IMSS platform so that you can register them for the social security system. And you as employer, you need to pay the proportional fee and to have that responsibility. Second, we need to help each other raise awareness. I think we have forgotten this sense of accountability in terms of gender equality or environment. We're still behind Entonces, in the labor este world, but we're still working on it. We are now working on it. Women that are leaders that are here with us today could help us with this kind of initiative. Thank you very much. Yeah, I think this is a wonderful way to finish or to wrap up this panel. We have been talking about super powerful, successful women, women with a lot of uh, entrepreneur stamina. And also, we discussed the most vulnerable groups of uh, workers, female workers. I would like to, Elizabeth Paula, hear from you. What could we do in order to help these women in vulnerable conditions so, they, so that they can thrive and they can survive even? So, Paula, let's start with you. Las mujeres en México Women son in una Mexico are a very amazing uh, en este país. strength en el minuto que, como dice uh, momentum Lisa María, in this uh, country. Soltemos, las empoderemos, the moment le, we le give them crédito, power and we believe in them and we give them education and possibilities, growth is going to be muy, so, muy so big in this Ese nation. We are going to accelerate growth. So we as privileged women, because we are actually in a privileged como position, como mujeres, with a role digo, at the companies vez, or eh, as women even, as one important character abajo, said, you need to send the elevator down so that you can lift un solo everyone de up. Cosa que All se right. hacer para Elizabeth, could you tell us about something in concrete in, in order to protect and help vulnerable groups? La es Paula, lo más at PepsiCo, well, eh, training. El, Training is crucial. Provide a background for these uh, vulnerable por ejemplo, uh, groups like disabled people no, or the elderly. We have a program years. for an uh, elderly called Golden Years. We provide uh, training for people over 55 years old. These people Entonces, didn't have more possibilities. Contexto, so when you create an ecosystem, 
existen. Correcto. El ser humano, the human beings, mujer, hombre, human cualquiera beings, de los ídolos que la vida te dio, men, brilla. Y eso es nuestro to shine, trabajo como mujeres aquí. Work, as nuestro women, trabajo es pavimentar el camino para que más personas también so tengan privilegios. To privileges. Privilege. And so along those lines, I think we just have to, as women, embrace our power. We're already powerful. We just have to become comfortable with it and then wield it and use it. We have $20 trillion in annual purchasing power. We spend very little of it with other women. We have to be more conscious about how we spend our money and the communities that we care about. It might be people with disabilities, it might be people in rural areas, it might be ethnic minorities or aboriginal communities or indigenous communities or LGBT communities. Whatever those communities are that don't have equal access, we have to take responsibility, uh, those of us in positions to influence, to actually think about how we spend our money. Join the minister's efforts to employ more people, buy from corporations like PepsiCo that are trying to source from women and hire women and promote women. Join the daring circle of the Women's Forum with Procter and Gamble and several other corporations that are trying to educate the world about how we can be more inclusive in our purchasing power. Um, but these are some very simple everyday things that I think every one of us is capable of doing and it will make a huge difference in the world. Thanks. Quiero se agotó el tiempo. Quiero agradecer okay, we ran out of time. Elisa, I want to Paula, thank you Lisa Elizabeth, María, Paula, Luisa María allá, and the audience. Thank you very interés. much for, for being here, Buenas for tardes. attending this uh, uh, panel. Thank you.